I am so excited to share that there are over, there are over 200 members of the Brandeis community signed up for this class, hosted by the Brandeis National Committee and the Brandeis Women's Network. A few housekeeping reminders before we get started. Please stay muted and use the chat function to ask any questions that you might have. You can also use the chat function to let us know who you are and where you're joining us from. And please share pictures of your soups after class on Brandeis Regional Facebook groups or with the Brandeis National Committee's Facebook page. We're also going to be taking a screenshot of all the participants making soup so right before uh, Barbara starts cooking, so if everybody could look at their, their screen and smile, it would be great. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Madeline Friedberg. Madeline is the former national president of the Brandeis National Committee, and she's a member of the Brandeis Board of Trustees. Madeline, it's all yours. Thank you. I couldn't be more excited and honored to have this opportunity to welcome our class instructor, Chef Barbara Camp. She's also my daughter. Barbara is a registered dietitian nutritionist, and she earned a master's degree in dietetics and nutrition from Florida International University. She's an associate professor at Johnson and Wales University of North Miami campus, where she teaches nutrition and food science. She's also a certified culinary medicine specialist through the Goldring Center for Culinary Medicine at Tulane University, and is certified in vegetarian nutrition through Cornell University. Before she became interested in food service, Barbara received her bachelor's degree from New York University, where her fields of emphasis were sculpting and smith silversmithing. She's lived all over the United States and has a great understanding and appreciation of each region's individual cuisine. She also lived abroad in England, where she continued to study sculpture, and in Brazil, where she became fluent in Portuguese. Please help me in welcoming Barbara and take us through this awesome class. Thank you. Hi. Oh, great. I'm muted. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction, Mom. Um, I am super excited to be here today and share with you um, not just the cooking techniques I'm going to talk about a little bit, um, but really the ease of making things like soup and how, and I love soup and for a lot of reasons. And one, because it's easy. Um, I can do them at any time, I can do them, you know, the day before, I can do them in the one soup we're going to do, um, the second soup, the gazpacho start to finish 20 minutes. So a uh, really quick way to sort of have dinner ready uh, instantaneously. But I also like about soups, especially these two soups, is they don't require really higher level knife skills. And I find that um, both with my students, so uh, day one open knife kit class, right? Which end of the knife do I hold, chef? Um, that the biggest barrier to being, to really enjoying cooking is knife skills. And I see that that's where the struggle is. So I have a couple of tips on knife skills. Um, my first one is avoid them and learn to use a blender. Blenders are great, right? Don't have to have good knife skills. Everything goes in the pot, you get a blender, you have a super elegant soup, fantastic way to go. The other one is pre-cut items. Um, my, super, my local supermarket is Publix, and in the produce section are already cut up vegetables, which I love if your knife skills aren't great, because why, you know, cooking shouldn't be tedium. And I think the piece that becomes tedium is a lack of knife skills. And then lastly, the other option is to improve your knife skills. And the way I always equate it for my students is, um, whatever activity is you like to do, golf, tennis, ride a bicycle, none of those things did you do the first time you picked up a tennis racket, a golf club, or got on a bicycle. And so it's practice. And that's the piece that I think there's like a disconnect. Like I should hold a knife, I've seen someone cut, I should be able to cut quickly and efficiently as they, as they do. Um, and so I think that practice is a really big one. Even if you've been cooking for years and years, just like my mom, who I'm gonna pick on right now, um, who's a horrible cutter, right? Terrible knife skills. First problem is she picks the wrong knife, right? She's afraid of a, a, 
of a knife. And the knife I'm using today, um, this is a eight inch chef's knife. It's pretty standard multi-purpose knife. This is a French chef's knife. Um, and the way you know it's a French chef's knife is because it's curved, right? It has this curve. And that curve is your friend. And so when we cut with a knife like this, right, it's not serrated, it's a completely smooth edge. Um, so this knife, what, you're, what, you're, what you want is to use the sweet spot. I don't wanna cut myself, but um, which is sort of here to here. That's the sweet spot. That is the, that is the part of the knife that you really wanna use. So it's important to pay attention to where you're cutting, like where on this knife blade are you actually making contact with your product? That's really important. The second thing is, how do we hold a knife? Right, so uh, the first one is, no, it's not a sword. So I'm not gonna hold it like I would grip a sword. I'm not dueling. I'm gonna take my in, uh, index finger and thumb and I'm gonna pinch and I'll lightly wrap the, my remaining fingers around. These fingers are for guidance, right? For sort of angle control. I'm holding the knife with this. It's not a death grip, right? Um, I, let it, I see a lot of people like, really squeeze on it. Of course, it's too shiny in here to see, but like, you don't want white knuckles, right? You don't want to get tired when you're cutting. So really nice sort of pinch, wrap. That's, that's sort of key. And the action is a circular motion. So I'm, I don't know if you guys can see what I'm doing, but it is a, the, the, the bottom end of my knife never leaves my cutting board and I'm, I'm rocking, right? So I'm going, up and around, up and around, up and around. This is allowing the blade to do the majority of the work and I don't get tired. And the last thing I always wanna do when I'm cutting is I want to have a claw. So my, I'm a righty, so my left hand is in this claw position always. Meaning my thumb, my pinky are inside this sort of cage of my other three fingers. These two fingers, are gonna make contact with the blade, which is why I can be cutting and looking at you or the computer, and I am no fear that I'm going to chop off any of my fingers. So 30 years of doing this, they're all, right? So the biggest thing is that if I always have contact like this, these two knuckles are always touching the blade, I cannot cut them off, right? So it's a rocking motion with these two. So um, in terms of practicing, right, softer things are easier to practice with. So I totally recommend potatoes for practicing. Um, I had roommates when I was in culinary school. They learned to love all things potato. So the first thing I'm gonna start working on is an onion. Um, the first thing I do with all produce is wash them, not just because of COVID, but they were in the supermarket. Um, so even before COVID, people are gross. Um, but now they're just more gross and they, now they can make you really sick. So I already washed this um, and peeled that loose papery outer um, skin. Just gonna trim off the growth end and I'm gonna very gently peel, sort of shave off this root end. So I'm only taking off of- Barbara, um, do you mind angling your laptop a little bit? Um, oh, uh, a little bit more? Sure, let me, let me hang on. Is that, can you guys see? Oh, there you go. Perfect. Yeah? Okay. That's excellent, thank you. All right, this is a huge onion. Uh, I'm only gonna use half of it today for this soup. So I've cut it in half. Now, depending on what I'm gonna do, I'll either leave this intact, the, the sort of um, root end where all the layers come together, or I'll cut it out. And in this instant, I'm gonna leave it intact. It's gonna help me. So the first thing, so now I have this half onion, I have the root end facing to my left, um, if you're lefty, the opposite, and the growth end facing to the right. I'm going to take my knife, again, I'm pinch, and then wrap those other fingers. My other hand is going to be with the fingers pointing up, holding the onion down, and I'm going to cut across the onion about sort of, uh, we'll say seven eighths of the way across. So not quite all the way through, but pretty far. So now I've cut a couple of layers. Now, depending on how fine I want this dice, I'll cut those la layers closer together or further apart. I'm gonna also angle
angle the, the onion to the direction of my arms and not move my body around the onions, if that makes sense, right? I'm always gonna move my product, not my body. My body always stays in the same position, right? Stronger position. I, again, I'm gonna use this sweet spot right here on my knife and I slice down. I'm not gonna worry about the little bits that are falling out, they're okay. So I'm gonna come down, right? And again, I'm gonna turn my onion and now I'm gonna cut across. And you can see once I've done that, that all my pieces are pretty much the same size. And that's what I care about. I care much more that my pieces are exactly the same size than I care about the size that they are. So if they are bigger, that's okay. If they were a little smaller, that would be okay too. But if they were some really big and some really small, what's gonna happen is that the small ones will burn before the big ones are cooked. And so the biggest piece is to have them all the same size. I'm just gonna cut through this remaining bit. And all I have left is that little bulb tight end, the root end. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna turn on my cooktop. I have an induction cooktop, which heats very, very quickly. Um, like it's probably hot right now. Uh, let your pot get pretty hot. Uh, when you're cooking, you really want to, especially in sauteing, and that's what we're going to do now, is you want that pot to be, or that saute pan to be hot. And don't be afraid of it being hot. You want that heat. You want that, you want, you know, I always tell my students that you cook with all of your senses. And that it's obvious, the, the smell, taste, those are obvious. Sight, that's pretty obvious. And they're like, chef, how do you cook with hearing? Because I want to hear different noises when food is cooking. And when I first drop these onions in, I want to hear that nice noise, that that oil was hot, that that pan was hot, that I'm getting a good sear, immediate sear on my onions. I don't want to steam them in this case. I want to actually develop a little caramelization. So while my pan is getting good and hot, let's talk a little bit about oil. Now this recipe calls for coconut oil. Is there any health benefit to coconut oil? So I'm gonna put on my dietitian hat. Um, the answer is no, right? Oil is oil. Calorically, they're all the same. Um, why does coconut oil get some sort of extra boost from- uh, Can you adjust your, I can't see. Oh, now. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, you know what my problem I'd like is, to my, see you. Right, my problem Thank is like, the, cutting board, the cutting board is here and I'm up yeah, there. Yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. I need, I, need a, I need a camera crew. Um, <laughs> yes, okay. Thank so, you. Uh, no problem. So um, in terms of cooking, oil does matter. Um, I don't recommend for cooking uh, extra virgin olive oil. What I actually re recommend extra virgin olive oil is a finishing oil. It has too many particulates in it. It's why it's so tasty, but those particulates burn. And when you saute with extra virgin olive oil, I think it imparts a bitterness to your food. So I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it as a cooking oil. I think it's a really good finishing oil and that you should buy the um, best olive oil you can afford in the smallest size bottle and use it very sparingly as a finishing oil. So um, either salad dressings is one place, but sort of on pasta, just as a drizzle at the very end to really get that beautiful green olivey flavor out of your olive oil. Um, so in this case, I am using coconut oil because I want that flavor to reinforce the coconut milk that I'm also putting in. You guys hear that? That's the sound I want. I want that really beautiful sizzle. Um, I have a question what, for you. Um, what size is a stock pot? My, this pot is a two and a half quart pot. Okay. Also, when we, we would like to see you, but yeah. we'd rather see the food. Okay, so I have a second um, camera up. It, it, can we switch to that one, Nikki? I didn't have any problems with my own. Can you hold on the pot view? Um, yeah. let's see if we can do that. Where's, where's that, uh, um, the one that's on your phone? Yeah. 
Yeah, the one that's coming from my phone. That that's the top view of the pot. I have to sort of look for it. If that's okay with you. Perfect. Okay. I think it still says just my name. How old are you going to be on? Or at our stove top view, it's, maybe. It's a brand I've seen. Oh, when? All right, so I want a little caramelization on these onions. Right. It starts at six. I don't I'm going to let them cook oh. for a bit. Okay. Please have the lady that's talking be quiet. Can can go go yes, P the host, Nikki, yeah. can you mute everyone who's not talking? Yes, yes, mute everyone. Okay, so you're still on my view. Nikki. Can everyone please stay muted? So let's talk about a little bit about um, curry. So we're gonna we're gonna let these onions soften and caramelize a bit. We want to get a little golden color on them, not super dark in this instance, but a little color. And once they've gotten to that point, I'm going to add my curry powder. Um, so curry or curry powders, Indian style curry powders are spice blends. And there are lots of different variations, right? So I was in London in um, Thanksgiving and um, I bought a lot of curry. Um, all different variations on what's in here. Um, but one of the things that they all have in common is they all have turmeric in them. Um, and why do we care about turmeric? Um, turmeric has an active ingredient called curcumin. And there's a fairly big body of evidence to support that curcumin is beneficial um, because it is, has some anti-inflammatory properties. And it's that internal inflammation inside of veins and arteries that are the contributors to the development of heart disease. And so there's some evidence that um, consumption of turmeric with that active ingredient curcumin is helpful. Um, that said, and that is, that is all absolutely good nutrition, good sound nutrition uh, science. That said, the problem is there's no way you're eating enough, right? There's just no way, unless you really, really, really like turmeric, um, which in and of itself doesn't have a particularly strong flavor. It's what gives curry its um, yellowy uh, color. Um, but, um, but in terms of being able to, you'd, eat, you'd have to eat like two or three tablespoons by itself um, a day to get enough curcumin to have any kind of real benefit. And power to you if you can do that, because I don't think I could handle it. So that'd be a lot of humor. All right, you guys, can you see inside my pot now? Nikki, do we find that view? So this, um, the view that I have up top is the same. Um, I'm unable to change it. So maybe if you just like tilt the camera to, to the pot. No, so it's, too, it's, it's pretty far. It's on the other side of my sink, so I can't. But the, you, can you find the one that's the phone? Because that one is right above it. So I can see that on mine. I don't know if I can, if there's a way I can. OK, let me try. It still says my name. Got it. I don't know if that helps. All right, so I have, I have, I have, whoops. All right, so at this point, I've, I've heated my pan. I put about two tablespoons of olive oil, or sorry, not olive oil, why did I say that? Um, coconut oil in here, it could be any other neutral oil, whatever oil you normally use. Like I said, with the exception of extra virgin olive oil. Um, I added my onion. And now I'm gonna add my, my curry. Um, I wanna add my curry at this point because I want my curry to heat up separately. Um, and I want it to really release its flavor into this pan before a whole lot of moisture goes in there. Um, technically, oil is not considered moisture. Right, because it's fat and not water. So we've added about a tablespoon of curry powder. I'm gonna add um, about a quarter of a teaspoon of red pepper flakes. Um, these are easily omitted. If you don't like too much spice, that you could, and if you like spice, you can put more. I'm gonna stir this around and really let the, the aroma guide me at this point. As this is toasting,
you can really get more of that curry aroma is going to start coming out. So I want to let it go for a bit. I want it toast. And I don't want it to sort of stick to the bottom too much. So I'm going to keep on kind of moving it around. So I've got my onions, my curry powder, and my chili in here. I'm going to let them kind of keep on cooking. And I'm going to chop up a little bit of garlic. I like to sort of just trim off that little fibrous end of the garlic. And again, because I know that I'm going to puree this soup later, I'm not so concerned with my sizes. Just want them to be pretty even. So I'm going to add my garlic now. And pretty soon after, I'm going to add my lentils. So um, these are red lentils. Um, they're orange in color. Sometimes they're called crimson lentils. Um, I really like them because they cook super fast. So I'm going to pour those in. Gonna... Abra, we have a question about the curry powder. Uh -huh. um, is that one that's particularly better? Uh... So it really depends on what's available to me. So if I have time, I definitely go to the Indian um, store and I buy um, a better Indian curry. I, I'm particularly fine, uh, fond of the Madras style curry powders. I like the flavor profile of them, um, the balance of sort of the, the heat of a chili to all the other ingredients that are in a, a curry. So every region of India has a different uh, kind of curry uh, in that same way that, you know, I live in um, South Florida, so we've got lots of island influence here. Um, Jamaican curry is a completely different style of curry. Uh, Japanese curry is completely different, and Thai curry is totally different. So curry isn't actually a single um, spice. Like you're, it, It's kind of like what we call chili powder. Regionally, they're going to be different. So I'm, I'm quite fond of, fond of madra style. All right, at this point, I am going to add, after I've let my... Um, Lentils sort of get coated with the oil. I'm going to add my water. Um, that was about three cups of water. And I'll add that. I'm going to kind of make sure all my lentils are not sticking to the sides. I'm going to let those go for a second. Um, I'm going to sort of let that, and that was cold water. Um, I'm going to add salt now. And I, you guys can't see the side of my cutting board, but take it from me that there are um, a lot of jars of salt. I love salt. Uh, I don't think it's evil or bad. I think the problem with salt is what I like to call manufactured food. Um, anything that comes in a box, a package, a can is the problem. It's not the salt itself, right? Um, you cannot add at home the amount of salt added to foods that come out of the factory. It's just not possible. You wouldn't be able to eat it. But the example I like to give is sort of chicken noodle soup. So if I heated up a can of chicken noodle soup for you, um, I believe it has around 2,000 milligrams of sodium for regular sort of Campbell's uh, made from concentrate chicken noodle soup, like the whole can made into a, with the additional can of water about 2,000 milligrams of sodium. If I were to make chicken noodle soup at home and I added to your one serving the amount that's in their one serving, it would be unpalatable. You would not be able to eat it. It would, it would burn a little. It's sort of um, the way your mouth feels when you leave a movie theater after eating salted popcorn, right? That numbness. You'd have that same feeling from the soup. You wouldn't be able to eat it. So. And then question. Add, yeah. Um, there's a question about lentils. Um, uh -huh. Do they have to be red or, you know, could someone use like other types of lentils? Um, for this application, I think they, they, you kind of want the red. I think you could use a yellow split pea as a substitute for this one. 
I would say you wouldn't want to use, say, a French green lentil. They're a little bit different. They're round and, and they wouldn't really, flavor-wise, wouldn't lend themselves to this application. I think that a, a yellow split pea would, would be the best substitute for a, a, this kind of lentil, right, um, in terms of flavor and texture. So that, uh, that's what I would use. I would use a yellow split pea. Awesome. Thank you. So salt. So in this application, I'm going to add salt. And the salt I'm adding is a, a French sea salt um, better, called salt gris, right? So it's gray salt. Um, I'm adding about a teaspoon. Um, and yeah, I actually do measure salt most of the time. Because again, like I said, you, you want to control salt, but you want to you wanna have salt. It's a flavor enhancer. And why it's a flavor enhancer is actually, it's not that it enhances flavor, it suppresses bitterness. And so that's why as humans, we really like it. Right? It suppresses bitter because we are predisposed to not like bitter. We learn to like bitter. That's why we drink coffee. Um, but we learn it. It's a learned behavior, not an innate behavior. So back to salt. So why do I have so many different salts? Um, and what's the difference? So why is this salt, this salt, salt gris? Um, this, is blur, this is the same as this salt, which is um, fleur de sel, which is flower, fleur meaning flower, my French not so good, um, fleur meaning flower. These are actually from the same exact place. And what happens is when they pile all the salts up together and as they let them dry, the heavier, wetter salt that has greater mineralization, the gray salt, sinks to the bottom of the pile. And the white salt, the fleur de sel, rises to the top. So why am I using the sal gris in this application? It has other minerals in it that give it a greater depth of flavor. It's a larger granule. And since I'm making a soup, it has plenty of time to dissolve. And I wouldn't use that sal gris. I won't use it in the other soup that we're gonna make because it's a cold soup. The, the salt won't have as much time to break down. I'm adding one can of diced stewed tomatoes or just, you know, from the store. And I'm adding a can of coconut milk um, that I've reserved uh, less than a quarter of a cup of for garnishing at the end. Next thing I'm going to add is, and this also is one of those things that could be omitted, those are cilantro stems. So cilantro stems are very tender and full of great flavor. Um, I don't want to use the leaf in this application. I really want the flavor to sort of slowly come out of the stem as opposed to sort of wilting out of the leaf. I want to use the leaf later as a garnish. So I'm going to use the part of the, the, the vegetable that is less sort of pretty. And since I, again, like I know I'm going to puree this at the end, I don't really care about how it's chopped. And I'm going to add that. Now, if you hate cilantro, don't add it. It is not an essential ingredient to this mix. Um, and you don't even really need to substitute it out for anything else. It, it won't, won't, you won't miss it. All right, so all of that. Last thing I'm gonna add is ginger. So I have a knob of ginger, and I think the recipe says a four centimeter piece, which is about an inch. I like ginger, so I'm gonna actually add a little bit more than that. So I'm gonna peel it. Just with a regular peeler. And I don't have to peel it perfectly because then I'm going to use my microplane. And I'm just going to directly into my soup. I'm just going to grate about half of this peak directly into the soup. This. And I'm going to let this simmer for about 25 to 30 minutes. So while that is doing what it's doing, I'm going to change gears, switch out my materials. All right. 
blender. All right, so that soup is doing its thing. Um, Nikki, can we switch to the top view again? Sure. Let's let me figure this out. <laughs> Nikki, you just pinned a video. Yes, no. Um, yes, I think. Okay, so now you guys can see me again and not the cooktop. Fantastic. Okay, so moving on. Um, this, this is sort of a variation on a traditional gazpacho in that I've added or this version has watermelon in it. And then what the watermelon does is that this really beautiful bright pop of sweetness and um, I think that watermelon pairs beautifully with cucumber. And so this soup has both the watermelon, the cucumber, the tomatoes, um, and the red pepper. And those flavors have come together in a really beautiful, very balanced way. Um, really summery, really bright, um, sort of very refreshing kind of flavors. Grab my cu cucumber out of the refrigerator. And my basil. All right, so what am I going to do? Um, in the pitcher of my blender, um, and I use a, I have a high speed blender, um, which I love, and I don't work for Vitamix and I don't get any uh, kickback from them. But if you're in the market for a blender, this blender is worth the investment. You know, they're expensive, but they're amazing. Um, Barbara, there's actually a question about the equipment. Uh huh. Um, is they mentioned a uh, blender and countertop blender, are they in, um, interchangeable? Wait, the immersion blender and the... Countertop? Well, okay, so are they interchangeable? The answer is not totally. Mm, they are somewhat interchangeable um, in that they both blend. What, what makes the high-speed blender, so um, the bullet, is that what it's called? Bullet something? Ninja bullet or something. Um, Bulletproof, I think. Yeah. yeah. Those will work as well. Um, there's another commercial brand called Blendtec, which are also amazing. Um, Vitamix was originally just a commercial blender, um, and then they branched out into the retail market. Um, what makes them different than, say, your sort of um, buy it at Target, Hamilton Beach uh, blender is the motor, right? This has a gigantic high speed motor that can crush through pretty much anything. The other difference is that there's a, the blade design is a little bit different in the way that it works. Um, it sucks things into the blade really efficiently. Um, and then the other one is it doesn't come apart, right? So you don't, un you know, like a, a sort of Hamilton Beach blender, you unscrew the bottom and the whole thing comes apart. That allows for a lot of um, movement. So it's not as tight. This is this is machined together. I can't take this apart, right? Like, in fact, if I need this to be repaired, I have to send it to Vitamix to get repaired. Um, and they're super good about that too. So what's, what's nice about this blender is this whole process of blending will take about a minute and the soup will be ready, right? So um, I bought, a, I have a, a almost eight year old who is addicted to um, Icy Pops. And so we make a lot of watermelon icy pops in my house. So I buy whole watermelon and cut it up. So um, I cut up watermelon. I'm just going to put it in. And on this one, on the recipe, which I don't, Nikki, did I send you, do I need to send you the recipe so you can share them with everyone? Um, I have the recipes. Okay. Yep. So I want to put everything in the blender in the order that it's listed in the recipe. 
So, okay, so I'm just going to share it on the chat box. I can't remember if I sent you both of them. All right, so there goes my, my watermelon. Um, I have an English cucumber. Um, so I'm not going to seed it because it doesn't have seeds. Um, but I am going to really quickly peel it. And it does not need to be peeled perfectly because everything, again, is going to get blended up. Um, you remove the peel, actually, traditionally, because uh, cucumbers are often um, coated in paraffin to help keep them fresh. So that's something you want to consider when you have a cucumber, why you peel it. It's just check to see if it has paraffin on the outside. And it, if they're, it's a very, very thin layer of wax. All right, so I have peeled that. I'm going to just very, really roughly chop this and put it in. And then you've got my romas or plum tomatoes, depending on where you're from. Um, right? Um, I call this pole to pole, right? So this is, I'm gonna cut a, a lengthwise cut on here. Then I'm gonna cut it one more time. So there's my half to, tomato. I'm gonna cut it again, same lengthwise. Then I'm gonna fillet it. I'm gonna come under the seed pod, right? So that's the seed pod. I don't want that in my gazpacho. I don't want those seeds. When you blend seeds, they tend to be bitter. Right, so there go my seeds. I don't like this side of the tomato. I'm gonna throw those right in my blender. So four tomatoes, they're small. You could add another one. If you're not using the watermelon, increase your tomatoes to the equivalent of the four cups of watermelon. Now on this one, you have a lot of options in terms of flavor profile. Um, traditional in gazpacho is a, a splash of red wine vinegar, maybe a little bit of either cayenne pepper or Tabasco, pretty traditional. Um, you have other options though. If you like spice, um, you could use the canned chipotle pepper in adobo, right? So one of those with a little bit of the adobo sauce in there will give you this really nice pop, right? A little, little heat and a nice smokiness because those peppers are smoked. So that's, that's a really nice option. All right. All right. So there's my, so next I'm going to add my onion. Um, on the onion, now last time when we had the same half, the same onion, I'm going to use this other half. I, I left the little um, root end intact. In this instance, I'm gonna cut that out because I'm gonna throw in the onion just roughly chopped. Barbara, is there um, a substitute for the onion? Um, or can it just be omitted? I mean, I suppose you could omit it. Um, I don't really have good, I mean, I don't have a non-alum base, um, uh, onion substitute, right? So I could say like, you know, you could add green onions would be perfectly okay. But if it's onion is the issue, there isn't really a good substitute for onion. So if, if it's just the onion, like these onions themselves, or um, if you're okay with say shallot, you could, you could sub out for shallot. But if it's the whole, the whole family of um, alums, probably not. I can't really think of a good sub. And then I'm going to add some garlic, maybe two cloves. Um, you know, this isn't be, going to be cooked, so those will be raw, which can be a little harsh. And then the last thing, I'm running out of room in my blender. Um, the last thing I'm going to add is red pepper. Now you could add the red pepper raw, um, or you could roast it. So I roasted this this morning to show you how easy it is to peel once I roasted it. Now, again, I have an induction cooktop. I couldn't do it on my cooktop. I put it under the broiler, cut it in half, 
put it cut side down and put it under the broiler. If you have a gas cook cooktop, put it directly on the flame, right? It will just roast right up. You want it charred, all the way charred, right? I mean, this looks pretty scary. Um, and that skin literally just peels right off. So you want to char it. You could do it outside on a barbecue grill. That'll work as well. But you want, you know, you, you could, and like I said, you could also add it in raw. All right. So, all right. So I have added all my main ingredients. How about um, the peppers? Can they be omitted? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, though I, I know for me, I don't tolerate raw peppers. I feel like they, um, they're the gift that never stops giving for me. There's a lot of repeating. Um, once they're roasted, they take on a different flavor profile. So if it's a, if it's a indigestion kind of issue, that one red pepper roasted in, in the grand scheme of what's in this whole dish, not really that noticeable. So I'm using red wine vinegar. Now here you have another option. You could use lime juice. It would be a beautiful way to go. Um, really bright, really summery, sort of keeping with the whole summer theme. Um, I'm gonna use red wine vinegar because I really like it. Four tablespoons. All right. And then, I'm going to use olive oil. And again, this is not a cooked preparation, so I want the best olive oil I can get. And the same, I'm going to add about four tablespoons, maybe three. That watermelon is quite wet. Now at this point, again, I have some options. I could use a dash of Tabasco or other hot sauce that you might like. Um, the the Chipotle pepper and adobo. You could use, if you don't like spice particularly, um, you could use, um, this is smoked paprika, which I'm very fond of. Um, uh, you could add a little smoked paprika. Um, I'm gonna use a French hot pepper, and I know you don't normally associate French cuisine with hot peppers, but they have a lovely hot pepper um, called Espelette, and it comes from the south of France. Um, really common there. It's quite spicy, like a cayenne. It's a very similar looking pepper, small pepper, um, like a skinny little red pepper. Um, has great flavor, right? So you don't just want heat for heat's sake. You want heat that also brings with it a whole bunch of flavor. So I'm just gonna, this has a shaker top. I'm just gonna put a couple of shakes in there. And in this instance, I am going to use sea salt. So this is a fine sea salt, right? And I'm going to use, again, about a teaspoon in here. I'm going to make some noise right now. So if you are using a um, Vitamix or a, a other high-speed blender, this one is, I'm going to select variable one, I'm going to turn it on, and then I'm going to quickly turn it up to about variable eight for about 45 seconds. And that's it, it's done, right? Was that fast enough, you think, right? I mean like dinner's yeah, ready. Yeah, that was quick. <laughs> it's ready, right? All right, so now I'm gonna just move some stuff over and talk a little bit about plating because I think that is probably, from a chef's perspective, um, it's the place where people go wrong a lot, right? And it, and it can make or break uh, your dish, I think. So, and then also I'm gonna- Quick go question um, uh -huh. about salt. Does it matter what kind of salt? Um, does it have to be kosher salt? Um, could it be sea salt, gray I salt? I use mostly sea salts. Okay. I use, I'll tell you what, I, I love salt. I think I already told you guys that. 
I love them. Um, and what makes a different salts taste different is where they came from. So what other minerals are in there? So like, um, again, I'm in Miami. So I have like a Florida Keys sea salt that is just lovely. Unbelievably expensive, so I don't use it that much because, you know, I have to ration it out. Um, I have, so in my, in my salt cellar, right, this is just a standard sea salt. I want to say it's from Spain. It's whatever Costco carries. It's very, very fine. It's as fine as iodized salt, which I don't use and don't recommend using for a couple of reasons. One is they have found that there are a lot of particulates in it, non-food particulates in iodized salt. So I kind of stay away from iodized salt. Um, this is my tabletop salt dispenser, right? So it's a grinder. It has a larger grain salt in it. This, I, this is a Spanish salt. Um, uh, sort of medium grain uh, Spanish sea salt. Let's see what else we got going on here. Oh, these are some of my favorites. These are flake salts. Um, they're English. So Maldon is a really famous one. Let's see if I can show it to you guys. Um, can you guys, my light, my, the sun is right there. Um, can you guys see that salt? It is flaky, right? Yeah, um, I can see it. It's a finishing salt. Um, you want to use it where it doesn't, isn't going to dissolve because you want that crunch that it gives. It's, um, it's like a little explosion of, of, of salty, fresh, clean saltiness. Um, this is also a flake salt that's been smoked. Um, also fantastic. And then, you know, I have like a, the, the Himalayan pink salt. The pink is from some other minerals that are in that area that give it another layer of flavor. Um, what I find is that with using sea salts versus iodized or kosher is that you can actually use a bit less because they have these other flavor complexities going on, which I think is a great way to go. Versus, um, like I said, I don't use iodized salt. Um, I'll use kosher salt in a pinch, but it's not my favorite. It's not my go-to one. I know lots of chefs who swear by kosher salt, but I think part of the reason is um, that they love it is it's cheap, right? So there, there, there's a, a, a reason to use it is that it's cheap. All right, so let's plate this one. I'm going to give you a couple plating options. So one is just to use any vessel that you have. So I have these very sort of stemmed, short stemmed glass, um, shimmery glass. Uh, I don't know what they are, goblets, I guess. And here I would just on this, had I used, say, lime juice in my mixture, I might actually just garnish it the way I would um, say a cocktail. So I'm just gonna garnish with a lime on the side of the bowl. And I have some chives that I just pulled out of my garden. Um, and chives actually work better with a scissor than they do a knife. A knife tends to crush them a little so I could just, I'll just cut some snip. So you're seeing a recipe where it says snip some chives. They really mean snip it, like with a scissor. Right, so maybe I'll just sort of. Barbara, can you talk a little bit about the consistency of the gazpacho? Like how much puree would you say um, one should do? You want it somewhere between super chunky and smooth, smooth applesauce. That, right? And, and again, you know, this is a matter of personal taste. I like it sort of medium, uh, like, like a homemade applesauce, a little bit of texture, a little bit of chunk to it, but I don't want pe individual pieces, right? So this is my one option for, for plating, right? Very simple, fresh, clean. Give me a second, I'll be right back. So I have a, I'm gonna tilt this down again so you can see what I'm doing. So I have my 
dinner plate with a napkin that I folded. And then I made a nice bowl. So this is the bowl made out of ice. So since this is a cold soup and it's served cold and I want it to be really cold, I think this is a super elegant, simple, and here I'm going to just float a little lime wedge on it, maybe some bigger pieces of chives, right? You guys see that? It's going to stay super pretty. cold, right? I mean, this literally, I filled this bowl. So this is just my regular bowl. Um, I filled it with about an inch of water, froze the water, got another bowl, set it on top of that frozen ice and filled it with water around it, put it back in the freezer bowl, right? Um, super easy. And I think a really um, great impact for service. Right, it's, I think this has a, a lot of ooh-ah factor to it, right? Um, if you're, if you're uh, more organized than I am sometimes, you can actually embed herbs in the bowl. So you have like this beautiful, like rosemary works really well, or the chives would work really well, sort of frozen inside your bowl, also very pretty. So, all right, I'm just gonna set this aside and go back to our other soup. So let's see how we're doing here. Barbara, that looks so elegant. It's really beautiful. That, I love that ice bowl. It's so easy and, and has a lot of impact. Oh, I didn't put my basil on, but that's okay. Um, so what Would you mind repeating the step um, about the ice bowl again? Somewhere sure. So, so I just took this, this is sort of a medium size mixing bowl. I filled it with about an inch, inch and a half of water, found a level space in my freezer. That was the biggest challenge. Froze it. And then after it froze, I, I, I put another bowl in it and filled it with more water. Put it back in the freezer. Um, I put a little bit of water in the bowl that I put on top to keep it from floating around. Um, and then I put it back in the freezer and then just pop the inner, inner one out and pop the other bowl out and I could make another one, right? It took, maybe it took an hour, right? For the freezer, for the water to freeze all the way. Um, and then the really nice thing is that if you don't love the shape of your bowl, you can run a little water on it, reshape it, make it deeper, make it more shallow, whatever you need to do, right? So I think my bowl, my first version of the bowl, the the bowl, the serving part of the bowl was too deep. So I just poured a little more water in and put it back in the freezer, right? Um, the other really want, nice one about it that my husband really appreciates is there's no cleanup, right? There's no dish to wash, right? And he is, he is the official dishwasher um, in my house, in my mom's house. He's just the official dishwasher. So uh, there's no cleanup. You just uh, drop it in the sink and let it melt. So it's kind of amazing. All right. Next, all right, Nikki, can we switch back to the um, stove top view? Yep. So this, this recipe I got from a chef named uh, Yoram Odolenghi, sort of a very, I sort of made some minor modifications to what he originally did. And he likes to serve it right at this point, sort of rustic. Um, I'm not a fan. I think it looks ugly. So I like to puree it. So I know it's done um, because I can pull a lentil out and it smushes with my fingers, right? I just smush that right with my fingers. So I'm going to use a different kind of blender. So now this is my immersion blender, right? Um, And why I like to use this is that, again, there's nothing, there's only one pot still. I don't have to transfer this into the blender hot and deal with that. So I'm going to make a little more noise again.
my regular bowls. Thank you, Ikea. And this recipe serves four. And that's a dinner size portion. So, this is my reserved, this is my reserved coconut milk. I'm going to just drop some little dots. I'm going to take the back end of my spoon here and I'm just going to swirl it a little. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to look, I love lime slices, I think they're quite beautiful. And then I have my reserved cilantro leaves that I'm just also going to place on here. Sort of randomly. And again, if, you know, just that difference of taking the time to sort of um, compose your plate. I'll turn it this way so you guys can see. To sort of compose that plate takes a very sort of pretty basic uh, lentil soup and elevates it. I think that a pureed soup personally is, has a more elegant look to it. Um, and it, you know, it's important to remember that we do indeed eat with our eyes first. And so that presentation just elevates the experience of having this soup. I would serve this maybe with a um, flatbread, um, a simple flatbread would be really nice with that. With my gazpacho, I might um, maybe have sort of a grain, a grain salad with that, uh, like a quinoa, like a light quinoa salad, or even maybe, uh, I don't know, tuna. Um, so in my house, it's not tuna, it's tuna, made with chickpeas instead of tuna fish. So those are our two soups. Barbara, how long would that last um, or stay fresh in the fridge for? Um, the gazpacho or the lentil? Both. Um, the gazpacho will separate, so you have to mix it up again, right? So the, the, it'll, the uh, water will sort of, or the watery parts of it will sink to the, to the bottom, and the top will, will have the um, fruit or vegetable pulp. So you have to be mixed again. Um, I would say the gazpacho probably four or five days. Um, uh, be, again, because it, it has, you know, a fair amount of, from the, the, uh, watermelon and the tomato and, and that sweet onion, there's a fair uh, amount of sugar content and uh, I would think it might actually ferment if you left it much longer than a week, so four or five days. The lentil soup will last a little longer and it freezes beautifully, right? This is a great one for um, freezing. So uh, that's, a, that's the other option. But again, I mean, I usually find that um, for most foods, fresh foods that you make, five days, week at the most, pretty standard. Um, but this definitely, the lentil soup freezes really well. It's a great one for freezing. Okay, if awesome. you don't have, have that 
processor that you have, can you use a regular food processor? The, instead of the one that I, the immersion one? Yes. Yeah, you could use a food processor, absolutely, absolutely. Um, what, I, what I love about the immersion blender, and again, not to tout one brand over another, there's lots of them out there. Braun makes one, Cuisinart makes one, lots of other brands um, make them. Um, and mom, my mom can correct me, but I think they're like $35. Does that sound right, mom? Put your space bar. I just ordered a new one because my 12, 20 year old one died. Uh, and it, at Bed Bath and Beyond, it's about fifty dollars. But then you get twenty percent off for the whole for the whole set. The just right. The, so it also they come with a they come with a mini chop and a container and a whisk and a bunch of other little attachments. Fantastic. Some of them are good. Some of them I've never used the whisk in my life, but I use the I use the mini chop thing all the time. So um, I think they're worth the investment because um, it then saves you. So all I have to all that has to be washed on that is this versus the, can you tell I don't like doing dishes? Um, the, and I actually don't, I have a husband, he's a, he's a dish washer. Um, that this piece is all you have to wash as opposed to when you, you know, break out the food processor, you know, you got the bowl and the lid and the plunger and the blade and the whole thing has to be um, cleaned. And now this, all I've got is this pot that, that the soup was in, all done, one place, ready to go. So I kind of like that. There's also not the issue of like transferring this really hot sort of molten liquid, burning yourself. Um, those are all things that I um, can try and take into consideration when uh, thinking about what piece of equipment I'm going to use. Um, are there any brands? Avocado. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nikki. Sorry. Oh, no, no. Go I was going to say, um, are there any brands that you recommend for the blenders? Okay, so for the for the upright blender, the regular blender, I am a big fan of Vitamix. Um, you know, they're they're expensive. They're it's a it's a hefty investment, um, three or four hundred dollars. Uh, but mine is going on fifteen years and still um, chugging along, super strong, no problems. Um, they sell refurbished ones for like half that price, and they're really good also. So I really do like Vitamix. Um, that said, I think that the Ninja makes a pretty good blender now. And that one's about $100. Um, I would stay away from the sort of Hamilton Beach, um, the one with like all the little buttons that I had when I was in college, um, that I never really understood what was the difference between puree and um, blend, right? They used to have those knobs, a uh, little buttons. Um, because they burn out. The motors just aren't strong enough to do uh, all the things that you might want to do in them, and they usually don't last years and years and years and years and years. So that said, depending on how often you use it, we use our blender a lot in this house, right? We are um, smoothie, icy pop drinkers, uh, gazpacho eaters. So um, we use our, this blender gets used once a day at least. Um, in terms of the immersion blender, I don't really have an opinion on brands. It's really more about the um, bits and pieces that come with it. So, and this is a kind of absurd reason to like one over the other, but the Cuisinart brand comes with a canister that has a lid and the KitchenAid one doesn't have a lid. And I like the lid on the little plastic container because then I could make like a blended salad dressing put the lid on and put it in the refrigerator and not have to think about like, oh, now I have to transfer this to another container because it doesn't have a lid. So that's, I know it's a kind of silly reason to like one over the other, but that's my rationale. So the Cuisinart one I, is the one that I've always purchased because the, the container has a lid. I hope that answered your question. I saw a question pop up about avocados. That's another option for garnish. The avocados in my supermarket were either mushy or rock hard. So I didn't buy avocado. Um, in that case, I would actually dice them super small, re like really, really small, like quarter of an inch by quarter of an inch, um, and just sort of um, sprinkle them on top, let them float on top as a garnish. Yeah, I totally forgot to add the basil to my gazpacho. It's sitting right here, and I totally forgot to add it. Um, on the basil, uh, you want to pick the stems off. So unlike the um, cilantro where the stems are great and they're soft um, and, and quite edible. The stems on basil are a little bit um, woody and tough. So I would pick the, um, 
and pick the basil off. Um, so you're just gonna have the leaf like this. And then just like a small handful, you know, maybe sort of the equivalent of um, half a cup, um, if you like basil, right? You know, again, the, the, the beauty of sort of a, uh, a soup like gazpacho is like, if you don't like watermelon, don't put it in, put more tomato. If you don't like spice, don't put it in, right? If you like spice, put more in. So those are all sort of your options. You know, if you, if you love sort of green onion, put green onion in really any, it sort of sky's the limit. If you don't, if you don't like say red pepper or you don't have a red pepper, you have a yellow pepper, use a yellow pepper or an orange pepper. I wouldn't use a green pepper. I think the flavor is a little too strong. Um, again, you know, you could use, um, I used a red wine vinegar. You could use a white wine vinegar. You could use lemon juice. You could use lime juice, you know, any, any acid, right? So you're trying to balance sort of the, the sweetness, um, in this case of the watermelon and then the and the tomato with some with an acid, right? You're trying to create sort of this um, layered uh, effect, right? And that's what makes the food that you think of when you think like, oh my God, that dish was so good, right? Whatever it is, like think of like to some dish you had and you were like, oh, oh, like I dream about that dish, that time at that place. That the thing that you're dreaming about is the layering effect of that food. So. The, 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 the ability to layer flavors is what makes sort of one chef brilliant and the other chef less brilliant. And so what you're trying to do is really bring out and really sort of not necessarily, you know, there's two philosophies here, right? There's sort of like a European philosophy, which is that um, flavors should blend together, right? They should all complement each other to create one, one sort of unified flavor. And the other philosophy, sort of a much more sort of um, Asian philosophy, is that the flavors should contrast each other. So um, if you've eaten Thai food, it's a really good example of that, right? So you know, you'll have a Thai dish and not only do they balance, you know, sort of contrast and layer flavors, so you'll have like really earthy umami flavors like soy brains, and then you'll have these really bright high notes like lime. And then you'll have that sort of the, you know, they also do it with texture. You'll have like the crunchy of some peanuts and the sort of, for lack of a better word, the mushy of the rice noodles, a really soft chewiness of a rice noodle versus this crunch of, of the peanut. That sort of creates this very interesting explosion in your mouth. And that's sort of what, why most, most people sort of eat Thai food if you like cilantro, because they're heavy in cilantro, um, have that experience with it where they're like, wow, that was so, you know, I always say like the lousy Thai place is better than the, than the, Chi the okay Chinese place. Like I'd rather get lousy Thai than okay Chinese. Chinese is a little different. It's a little bit more, you know, Chinese food is like all kind of middle note, right? You're all here, unless it's really spicy, right? Otherwise you're kind of like right here. Whereas in Thai food, you're like up, down, in, out, crunch, soft, right? That's part of that explosion of flavor that makes food sort of um, pop and make it exciting. And that's what you want. And I would say even more so when looking at um, plant-based cuisine, because most, when we talk about food and, and, and food notes, so if we sort of compare food flavors to music, um, you know, the obvious ones like high notes are, are your acid, your lemon, your lime, your, your, your hot sauce. Those are, those are high notes. Your low notes are like your, your grilled meat, your, your grilled mushroom, your, your really earthy, low, kind of hold the base in the music um, notes and flavor. And then everything else kind of falls in the middle. Think like uh, at zucchini, cucumber by itself. Like it's just sort of middle note. And, and when, you're, when you're dealing with a plant-based diet, a lot of your food is coming from this middle note area and needs a little bit more manipulation than um, a meat eater diet, right? Because a meat eater diet is already going to be high in, in umami. And if you guys are familiar with umami, sort of like the fifth flavor sensation, right? So um, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter, and then umami. And umami is, I like to call it the of food. It's the, it's the why we like grilled, like why you like a roasted chicken better than a boiled chicken, right? It's that that the roasty notes that come out, that as humans, we are predisposed to like it. Just across the board, we just, every culture, we like it. And so in, when we're talking about plant-based cuisine, to really maximize that, we have to work a little bit higher. So harder to do that, right? So 
in, for example, in the, in the lentil soup, I caramelize those onions to develop that depth of flavor, right? So that's a step I would never skip in this instance um, to really bring that heavy, that richer, darker note to this dish. And then it has all these other really high notes, right? It's got um, the cilantro, which is definitely a bright green kind of note. I mean, that, if, if someone asked me to describe the flavor of cilantro, and if you like cilantro, if you hate cilantro, it tastes like soap. Um, if you like cilantro, I, to me, it tastes like green. Like if I could, if a color had a taste, cilantro is green, right? Um, so, it, you know, getting that layering of flavor creates interest. So I would encourage you to just say, you don't really have to play around with it for your palate, right? So, you know, with this gazpacho, like I said, you know, don't like watermelon, take the watermelon out, increase the tomato. Don't, don't love red wine vinegar, try a champagne vinegar. Uh, you know, uh, uh, lime juice, lemon juice, any, any acid will work. Nikki, you got, do we have any other questions? Yes, there is a question about, um, can you use vegetable broth instead of water for the lentil soup? Um, the answer is, if you make your own, yes. If it's coming out of a can or a box, no or if God forbid, it's a bouillon cube, for sure not. Because the problem with canned, boxed, and especially bouillon cube or powder is really what they are is salt. And you're not controlling the salt. In the same way as if I'm baking, I'm gonna use um, unsalted, when I ate butter, unsalted butter, not salted butter. I wanna control the salt and maximize its um, usage versus using one that's already salted. Now, if you're using your own um, uh, stock that you make, and, 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 the, and the key of stock is that stock is not salted. Um, it's not salted until it's made commercially. Um, like my stock is, it, it's in my refrigerator, and yeah, you could absolutely use it. It's gonna add more flavor. But in this case, it's, it, you know, it's not really necessary, because you're gonna get a ton of flavor from everything else that's in this dish. Excellent. Um, another question that's um, unrelated to the recipes. Um, Chinese curry, what is it good for? Uh, so Chinese curries um, have, uh, like I said, the, you know, curry is a blend. So it has a different ratio of um, spices in there. Um, there are some sort of Southern Chinese dishes that are curry based. It's, it's, it's yellower. It's very yellow usually, um, and usually um, it's, it's actually the curry that you see a lot, um, like McCormick's standard curry has a much more sort of uh, Chinese-y bent to it than, than uh, Northern Indian bent to it, which if that, you know, um, you know it's about preference. Like I, I don't, I personally don't care for like the Japanese curry at all. Like I don't like it. Um, but it's, you know, it's personal preference in the same way that I'm sure, you know, if you, if you eat chili powder, there, there are different blends, you know, there's, there's like a, a, you know, New Mexico sort of more style than a Texas style of chili powder blend. Um, it's really about what pepper was used, how much sort of, what, what's the ratio of say cumin to garlic to, to the peppers, like all of those are going to change the, the way the, the flavors, right? So the actual type of pepper that is used, which is why I love that Madras style, because it has, it has good heat, um, but tons of other flavor. And I'm a big fan of like, it can be spicy, but it needs to be something other than just spicy. Like, say for example, I'm not a fan of Tabasco. I think Tabasco has one note. It's like vinegar spice. It's kind of boring, right? Okay. And it's great on your, it's, you know, on your eggs, fantastic, have it on your eggs, but like, as an ingredient, it just doesn't, it's not very dynamic. And since there are like a gigajillion different hot sauces out there, go try them, right? And some of them aren't hot, right? They're, 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 they are they're have a little, they're picante there. They have a little um, prickliness to them, but not burn your mouth like, oh, I'm dying. No, I'm sweating. No, right? So if you want that really, the sort of more complex flavors. Okay, I don't see any more questions, so I'm going to hand it over to Amy Cohen. 
Um, Barbara, uh -huh. these were really, really yeah. awesome, fun, elegant dishes. So thank you so much. Um, Amy? Okay. Um, first of all, I just have to say I'm so excited about that ice bowl that I can't stand it. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us for this event and a special thanks to Madeline Freeberg and um, Barbara, Chef Barbara Camp for leading the class. Um, a recording of this class will be available soon on the Brandeis Alumni Association website. Um, again, please share your soup pictures on the Brandeis Regional Facebook groups or send to the Brandeis National Committee. And we have a lot of programming going on at Brandeis. So be on the lookout for many other events from Brandeis University. Um, there's something for everyone. You won't be disappointed. Most importantly, stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks for coming tonight.